All right. <clears throat> so endocrine, you're going to find when we go through here, there's going to be some stuff in here like that would have been fucking nice to know before we did this chapter or this chapter or this chapter. I have to use my best judgment. So endocrine glands, of course, when we talk about anatomy, you don't really have to find too many endocrine glands, right? When you're doing the anatomy stuff because they're kind of spread all over the place. But these are the general glands that are throughout your body. We've talked about the hypothalamus as being part of neuro, but we also know that it um, has a role in controlling the pituitary gland. Then you have your anterior and posterior. We talked a little bit about that before. The pineal gland we talked about in neuro. We'll mention it a little bit uh, today as far as some disorders go. We talked about thyroid and parathyroid. We talked about the thymus when we did, um, um, what did we do? The immune system. So we're not going to go over that. And I'm going to argue that it's not a true endocrine gland. We talked about some of the adrenal gland. We'll finish the rest of that today. We did not talk about the pancreas at all, except in the digestive chapter for its exocrine function. So we're talking about its endocrine function today. And we talked about the testes and ovaries. We're not going to do another sex lecture today. Okay. Yay. <laughs> um, and then I have this list of organs at the bottom, because if you remember, the heart secretes hormones. Do you remember what hormone that is? Natriated peptide. peptide, good. Kidneys secrete several hormones, erythropoietin, renin. Um, stomach, we know that secretes hormones, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. oh. <laughs> um, small intestine also, liver. Skin, although we're not going to get into too much of that. I guess I am recording. Adipose tissue, like, floods your body with hormones, but we're not going to get into any of those. So we'll hit the major endocrine glands and how they work and kind of go over some diseases associated with them. So uh, control of hormone secretion. In their previous lecture, it looked like tropic hormones, and then these were sub-bullets, like they were part of tropic hormones. This is how hormone... Uh, the release of hormones is controlled. So some are tropic hormones. They're controlled by another hormone. So for example, the hypothalamus secretes CRH, corticotropin releasing hormone. That tells the anterior pituitary to secrete ACTH, adrenal corticotropic hormone. And then that tells the adrenal gland to release cortisol. All right, those are examples of uh, tropic hormones. Um, Glands can also respond to changes in substances in the body, uh, sodium, calcium, things like that. That's why I have those electro that electrolyte chart there, just as a reminder. That's not an exhaustive list. That's just clearly if I have a palm tree here, then what I have in pictures here is not a true representation of what it's actually doing. All right. And the nervous system also stimulates glands, as we've seen uh, in a couple instances as well. So this is just another picture showing that, um, kind of a summary of what's in the previous slide in pictures instead of words. So this would be humoral, like this would be if calcium is low, what hormone gets secreted? If calcium is high, what hormone gets secreted? Neural, and then tropic hormones. All right, now for types of secretion. Um, Typically, your endocrine secretion, endo means inside, so it's going to be secreted internally to your body. So that means it's going to go into the bloodstream. All right. Once a hormone's in the bloodstream, where can it go in the body? Anywhere. Okay. And we have already talked about, but it only causes changes in certain target cells. And what makes a target cell a target cell? Receptors. The receptors that it has for that hormone. All right. Exocrine secretion, to contrast that, is something that gets secreted into a tube or a duct and goes to the outside of the body. All right. Good examples of that is pancreatic exocrine secretions. You have uh, um, pancreatic amylase, you have those uh, proteases, and you have, what's the one that uh, buffers acids? Bicarbonate. Bicarbonate, good. Get secreted into the duodenum of the small intestine. So that would be exocrine. Did I miss a slide? I 
I feel like I'm missing a slide. All right, so this would be uh, endocrine. We talked about neuroendocrine, and we'll give some examples of that later. There are also two terms, paracrine and autocrine. Think of um, the blood clotting pathway when um, cells were damaged. They released factors that um, started the blood coagula coagulation cascade. That would be an example of a paracrine secretion, so it just is local. And autocrine secretion is, auto means self, right? So autocrine secretion is you are releasing a hormone and you're stimulating yourself, cellular masturbation. Okay. Um, can anybody think of a good example where that happens? We talked about it. It's on your next exam. No? All right, the brain, there might be instances where it can do it, but a better example. The immune system. The immune system can stimulate itself. So uh, mainly what we're going to be talking about is endocrine. So we're not going to worry about those other ones, but you should know what the different types of secretion are. If we contrast the way that the nervous system works to the endocrine system, because both of those systems control things in the body, the nervous system has a direct connection to its target organ, and you release chemicals, and it binds to receptors and opens up channels, or does, that's primarily what it does. Whereas hormones, they get to their target cells, but they do it through a long, winding pathway through the bloodstream. Okay, so they both have target cells. One is a direct plug-in, the other is you know, flooding the body, hoping one cell has a receptor. All right, and so we already talked about this. Uh, you guys gave me this answer, underline, that's an important part. The more receptors a cell has, the greater the response, okay? Which is why when we did the female reproductive system and uh, some of the uh, estrogens and progesterones put more FSH and LH receptors on the uh, uh, granulosa cells, they did so so that they would have a greater response, okay? So uh, that's a, one example of that happening, okay? What else do we know about receptors and hormones besides they bind to a receptor? Can norepinephrine trigger a thyroid receptor? They're very specific, all right? So you have very little cross-reactivity. I did give you one example at one point in time where there is significant cross-reactivity between receptors, though. Which, where, what types of hormones are those? Do you remember? Give you a hint. The receptor is inside the cell. Steroid, Steroid hormones. Remember that cortisol can cross-react to the aldosterone receptor, for example. Speaking of steroid hormones, there they are, okay. Steroid hormones uh, derive from cholesterol. Of course, they all have that ring in them. Do you guys know what that ring is called? Cyclopentano perhydrophenanthrene nucleus. <laughs> the only, only reason I know that is I had a friend in graduate school who kept like, do you know what that's called? Do you know what that's called? I'm like, all right, I can't forget it now. Um, so they're all derived from cholesterol, therefore they're all lipid soluble, and therefore they are all, have their receptor inside the nucleus because it can go right through the membrane. These are all your examples of typical uh, steroid hormones. Oh, that sucks. All right, give me a second here. I know that's smaller, but you guys have it in front of you too. Um, so we talked about all of these. What is this 125 dihydrocolocalciferol? Vitamin D, all right. Vitamin D is also technically a hormone although it is not derived from cholesterol like the other ones are. All right. All 
right? We talked about where the receptor is located. Now, with um, because steroid hormones can get right through the cell membrane, their receptor can either be located in the cytoplasm. If that's the case, it will translocate into the nucleus where it will bind to a specific section of DNA and start transcription or translation. Or the receptor can be in the nucleus already waiting for a hormone to bind to it, and then it will begin the same process. I, in either case, if you are binding to a specific region of DNA and um, starting the process of transcription, hormone plus receptor are technically called transcription factors. Okay, so there are a very specific example of a transcription factor. Now, because you're making new hormones, you have to transcribe, you have to translate, you have to fold properly and put in the proper location in the cell. All of this takes time. So steroid hormones take time to have their effects. But like we've said before, what is the other side of that? Their effects last for longer periods of time. Now contrast that to non-steroid hormones, which are our amines, peptides, and proteins, or glycoproteins. <clears throat> Those are generally water soluble. So where is their receptor? Right on the cell surface, right? So when a hormone binds, what do we rely on to get that message inside? Second messengers. Okay, so your second messenger. And what is the most common second messenger that you hear about in any hormone-related class? G-protein? Nope. C-A-M-P. All right, G-proteins can go to make cyclic AMP, but it's cyclic AMP that is the most common second messenger. And you'll see that in a lot of different... Uh, hormone receptor pathways. Um, when we talk about amino acids being uh, hormones, typically they're derived from tyrosine. Right? Typically they're derived from tyrosine. So if you start with tyrosine as the base, you can actually make dopamine from that, norepinephrine, and epinephrine from tyrosine. So all of them are along the same pathway, uh, telling you that they have somewhat related uh, functions to each other. All right. Do you guys remember the one other, never mind, it's right there, T3 and T4. <laughs> Damn it. T3 and T4 are also um, uh, tyrosine-derived hormones. But what's the big difference between your catecholamines on the right and your thyroid hormones? There's a huge difference in how they act. Do you guys remember what that is? I'll give you a hint. We started this non steroid hormones by saying, where's the receptor, right? T3 and T4 are lipid soluble. Right, T3 and T4 are lipid soluble, so their receptor is actually inside the cell. And we talked about that a little bit when we did the thyroid hormones in the, uh, in the lab a couple weeks ago. Actually, it was June, 10, June 29th. I only know that because that's what your lecture said. Okay, so we've talked about all that already. Non-steroid hormones, we know they bind on the outside. They start a signaling cascade on the inside. Sometimes that starts with a G protein coupled receptor and produces cyclic AMP. Sometimes, is cyclic AMP the only intracellular messenger? No. Sometimes it can be diacylglycerol and inositol triphosphate. Um, sometimes it can be cyclic GMP, or as we saw with... Uh, vision, just GMP, all right? Now, since everything that's needed to activate a pathway is already present in a cell and doesn't have to be made, what can you say about the action of non-steroid hormones compared to steroid? They are faster, but that means their signaling is also very short-lived, good. You're talking about activating versus um, making than activating. Okay, so what this picture is just showing you is, uh, let's assume a 
non-steroid hormone binds there, activates your G protein coupled receptor, that turns on adenylate cyclase and you make cyclic AMP. All right, so that was a, your typical example of how that would work. Am I gonna have you know alpha separates from gamma and beta? And no, that's not important. The importance is some kind of second messenger is produced. All right, what do second messengers do? Well, we saw in the case of that cyclic GMP, for vision, it closed a membrane uh, channel for sodium. Uh, so that would be an example of altering membrane permeability. Can also activate enzymes inside the cell, uh, like insulin, for example, will activate enzymes that take glucose and turn it into glycogen. Promotes protein synthesis, okay? as well as these other things done a list. So um, lots of different things, and every hormone's gonna have a slightly different function, and every hormone could potentially have every single one of those functions. All right, depends on the hormone, it depends on the timing. We'll see a little bit of that once we get to insulin. Um, almost immediately, when cyclic AMP is made, it's destroyed by something called phosphodiesterase. Okay, almost immediately it's destroyed. So that is what's going to shut down the pathway and why the reaction is generally short-lived. <clears throat> All right, I'm never gonna ask you this, but this is your list of hormones that use cyclic AMP. And out of all the hormones that we're gonna go over, what's not included in there? Steroid hormones, right? Plus probably a couple others, but it doesn't matter. These are just some general hormones that use cyclic AMP and a list of some other second messengers. All right, now we already said that the more what that's on a cell, the bigger the response, the more receptors. However, we also have this phenomenon called amplification that happens within the cell. Let's say, for argument's sake, that there's only one receptor for this particular hormone. That one receptor, once the hormone binds, can activate multiple G proteins. Each G protein can activate multiple adenylyl cyclases, and each adenylyl cyclase can create multiple, multiple cyclic AMPs. Each cyclic AMP can activate multiple kinases. So it goes on and on and on. The, cell, uh, the signal gets bigger and bigger and bigger the more things you trigger. That rhymed. So in that way, does that make sense? You amplify the signal coming from that one receptor because you're activating so many things in the cell and it has like a, a feed forward effect. Okay, so it does not just a number of receptors, it's also that amplification inside the cell. Now, could you not have all that stuff there and part of your hormone response is to make that stuff so you amplify the signal? Yes, that can happen too. All right, and then of course we know that most hormone actions operate with this negative feedback pathway. Okay, so negative feedback says what? When you release something, it changes something in the body, and that change can go back and shut off a pathway, okay? That's our negative feedback pathway. So, in that way, it regulates itself, okay? Which is why, if you take, at any point in time of the day, blood and measure hormone levels, it's gonna be different throughout the day because these feedback cycles are constantly going, let's say this is calcium, okay? Calcium's gonna go up, you're gonna release a hormone that brings calcium down. Calcium gets too low, you release a little hormone, brings calcium back up, okay? So all throughout the day, that hormone level is gonna be changing. The true concentration is the average of all those ups and downs. Okay, so whenever you hear, like, this is a concentration of hormone that should be in the body, actually, when you look at someone's chart and it says any concentration of anything, is there ever a single number? No, it's always a range. Okay, and this is one of the reasons why. All right, do I need to go over the general 
how f negative feedbacks work? No? Okay, good. We also have positive feedback, all right? Positive feedback is, Kirsten, you're doing a great job in this class. You're awesome. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> all right, that is positive feedback. But what we mean in this case is that whatever is produced can feed back to the beginning of the pathway and cause the release of more of that substance. So uh, you guys should remember, we didn't show this exact picture, but you should remember this as part of the female reproductive cycle, where at a certain point in time, estrogen and progesterone will positively feed back to the hypothalamus and pituitary and cause more FSH and LH release, and that gives you that LH surge, okay? That's positive feedback. But you'll also remember that when we produce thrombin in the clotting cascade, that produces more thrombin, conversion of prothrombin to thrombin. That's positive feedback. If you listen to the asynchronous lecture about childbirth, remember we didn't finish female hormones, we got, you guys had to do that on your own. That talked about baby pushes down, stretches, sends a signal up here, oxytocin release, goes down, pushes, stretches, and keeps cycling back and forth until, until what? When does it shut off? When the baby's born, okay? When the clot's made, okay? So positive feedback happens too, but that is a much less uh, common occurrence than negative feedback. All right, now, just like anything in our body, once a hormone is secreted, um, we don't want it to stay there forever. Uh, when we're talking about uh, axons releasing uh, neurotransmitters, what's the mechanism that gets rid of that neurotransmitter in a synaptic cleft? Pardon? Enzymes that break it down. Also, reuptake. Okay. As far as hormones go, since they're in the blood, they have to kind of go over a different mechanism. Sometimes they're destroyed. Sometimes they're taken into a cell and destroyed inside the cell. Sometimes they're transported to uh, uh, the liver for destruction. Binding to tissue sometimes inactivates them. They're taken in and the receptor and the hormones destroyed. Sometimes they're secreted by the X. Sometimes they're put into bile. And when bile is secreted, where does all that ultimately end up? Hmm? Feces. Feces. They poop it out, okay? And some is peed out, all right? A good example of, you guys can do this experiment at home. Go home, take a multivitamin in the morning. Don't do shit all day and see how yellow your pee is. Why is it yellow? Because you're peeing those B vitamins out and that's what makes it that really bright fluorescent yellow. because your body's secreting the excess that it's not using. That's why I said don't do shit. If you go out and run 10 miles, you might not see that. I miss running. All right, this is gonna seem way out of place. Um, and I thought about changing it for this lecture and putting them where they belong, but then I'm like, well then that doesn't get the point across as well. And it matches a very specific set of IOs, okay? Hormones in bone. So we've already talked a little bit about this. Hormones uh, are, bone remodeling is controlled by, uh, partially by hormones. One of those hormones is growth hormone, all right? And what that specifically does at these epiphyseal plates here is it simulates cartilage cell division. And when cartilage cells divide, what are they gonna do? They're gonna push in opposite directions. And what's that gonna do to your bone? It's gonna lengthen it, okay? So that's what growth hormone does. So if we don't have enough growth hormone when we're children and our bones don't grow, what's the result of that? Dwarfism. It's, I don't know why, you guys, so Facebook sometimes shows you these reels, right? 
and every once in a while I'll get sucked into it. And of course you scroll through them. And lately I've been getting these reels about this uh, comic who has dwarfism. And he's up there talking about, uh, he's talking about his dad. Um, you know, it, this is exactly what he said, so I'm not saying anything that's like offensive. He said, my dad, you know, you can't hit a midget. You can't punch him, that would look really bad. So what he would do is he would take me and set me on the counter then walk away. <laughs> and, then call my and then call my sister and say, hey, look, I made an elf on a shelf. <laughs> I was like, okay, you can say that, I can't. <clears throat> I just thought it was funny, like the, he's, he's pretty funny. Um, speaking of comics with disabilities, you guys ever heard Josh Blue? He's got, um, oh God, what, cerebral palsy? Oh. Mm -hmm. And he walks around like this, he's got the hand thing. Mm -hmm. The dude's hilarious. Okay, <laughs> um, all right, back, back on track. If you have excessive growth hormone, that means your bones are growing longer um, than what they should under normal conditions, that leads to gigantism, so extremely tall people. Good example of that is um, uh, Andre the Giant, pro wrestler, former pro wrestler, dead guy. Um, he's interesting because if you continue to have excess growth hormone after your epiphyseal plates have sealed, then you get what's called acromegaly, so your soft tissues start growing thicker and you get these very distinct facial features, like he was like a very thick guy. And one of the reasons for that was because of the acromegaly, the increase in growth hormone after puberty. All right, thyroid hormones can also have effects on the bone. And the effects thyroid hormones have on the bone is they also stimulate cartilage replacement. So not as much like growing the bone, but replacing the pool of cartilage cells. If you don't have thyroid hormone, that delays bone growth as well. Um, so does it affect your organs as well? Like if you get most of them, are your organs smaller? Because I feel like it could it could be kind of look like really full in the belly. Um, I guess that depends on the reason for the dwarfism. Sometimes it's a uh, not just a growth hormone thing, sometimes it's a genetic thing that's happening. Right. I mean, like, for, in this instance. For this? Um, the a answer is I don't know for sure. Okay. <clears throat> now you got me curious about it. <laughs> no, that's fine. Look it up. Uh, I encourage you guys to do that. Jesse. <laughs> All right, sex steroids. Sex steroids also uh, affect bone growth, and I think this is fascinating. Testosterone causes greater bone growth than estrogen does. So that's why if males and females hit puberty at the same time, males are generally going to get taller quicker because the effects of testosterone are much greater than estrogen. Is that true in every single person? No, because you're going to see a variety. But Generally speaking, this is how it works. However, also generally speaking, males are, tend to be taller than females. And the reason for that is estrogen closes the epiphyseal plate faster than testosterone does. So females have a slower rate of bone growth and bones stop growing sooner than males do. Okay? So I think that is... Uh, really interesting. And because of that, females don't have as high of a bone density. All right, so especially before the age of 30, it's really important for females to get exercise and walk, not just like running around or doing like crazy stuff, just walk, because that'll increase your bone density um, more so than somebody who does not. So like I did gymnastics and Uh, I haven't heard that. I would say a mechanism for that would probably be because you are compressing your bones so much. 
with it, you know, as as hitting so hard. I don't I don't know. I mean, it's like the intensity of the sport messes up your hormone balance, which and there's that too, overall. right? Some hope, some what? I'm just like athletes who know going into puberty until like 17, 18, 19, 20, if they train their body to the touch, they can still. Okay, right. Um, my wife is actually an example. She was a collegiate rower, mm -hmm. like crew, um, and uh, her body fat was like so low that she didn't have a menstrual cycle for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. um, again, highlighting the um, effects on hormones. However, she is tall for a female. She's not taller than I am. I wouldn't have married her if there was. That was true. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. And then calcitonin and parathyroid. We talked a little bit about how that works. I'm not going to go over it here because we're going to talk about it later. Okay. So um, and that has more to do with calcium handling, not necessarily bones itself. All right, now some one-offs. Pineal gland. We know that's a pineal gland located in the back. You guys, <laughs> I was up there with you today asking me all kinds of questions about the pineal gland and why is it different in this model versus this model, um, which is great. But we know where it is, generally speaking. We know what it does. When you have low light, it releases a hormone called melatonin, and you go to sleep if that works for you. All right, um, and then of course when light comes in, it wakes up. We talked about that when uh, we did the neuro. Uh, one other thing that we didn't mention is that they think, and there's research to suggest that in animals and possibly in humans, that uh, the pineal gland may inhibit gonadotropins during winter months. All right, so if you're inhibiting gonadotropins during winter months, you're not producing testosterone, you're not producing estrogen, you're not having um, <clears throat> the effects of those hormones on your body there. And then when, because of dark, right? Um, you have more dark during winter months. Okay. Then when it starts to get spring out and you start having more light enter, then hormones start coming into effect. And what do we know about animals in the spring? Mating season, right? So, uh, they think that the pineal gland may be involved in that. All right, a couple interesting things as far as diseases go about the pineal gland. If you have a tumor of the pineal gland, because of where it's located, right here, let's imagine that getting big, you can block the flow of cerebral spinal fluid. All right, and if you block that flow of cerebral spinal fluid, that can lead to, if you're young, hydrocephaly, where your um, um, fontanelles have not closed yet and your head gets big because it has too much water in it, which is what hydrocephaly means. Um, so that can be bad. And mostly in adults, you can have circadian rhythm disorders. Now, the first two, delayed sleep phase disorder and advanced sleep phase disorder, what those mean is that you are going to bed later and waking up later delayed sleep disorder, or advanced sleep disorder, going to bed earlier and waking up earlier, all right? Now, the question is, what do you mean by earlier or later? That's compared to your normal, okay? So if you develop this circadian rhythm disorder, it's delayed going to bed and delayed waking up compared to what your normal schedule was prior to the problem, okay? Jet lag is another circadian rhythm disorder related to you know, crossing time zones and um, travel, and shift work disorder. <laughs> One time, I picked up a night shift at my nursing job. Never again, <laughs> never again. It was horrible. I, I couldn't sleep before I went in, and then I worked an entire 12-hour sh shi shift, and then I couldn't sleep when I got home. Now, what I, what I hear is that you get used to it, but uh, I'm, too, um, I'm too old for that shit. 
you get used to it. It's uh, no, no thanks. I will, I, but I tried it. I tried it, and it didn't work for me. Do what? No, it sucked ass. Um, I also, you know, if you do night shift work, especially as a nurse, and you have to go in and check on the patient, and you have to wake them up, like I don't like doing that. Like I just want you to sleep, and like. Can you get a I don't think so, but I don't know. Yeah, you work your preceptor's hours. Now, I haven't heard of anybody saying that, but that doesn't mean it's not true. And plus, there are all kinds of rotations that are electives that are coming up as students are going through. So, don't know. I think it might, if you've never done it, experience it once. <laughs> and you'll be like, nope. <laughs> I will be a family practice provider. Um, all right. Now we'll go to the real, like, okay, 39 minutes and we're just now getting to real hormones. HPA axis, all right? HPA, hypothalamus, pituitary, specifically the anterior pituitary to the uh, peripheral endocrine gland. That could be the thyroid, that could be the adrenal gland, that could be gonad, go gonads, gonads, okay? So HPA, HPT, HPG axis, all right? And of course, we know we have a tropic hormone from the hypothalamus, a tropic hormone from the anterior pituitary, and then our for real hormone coming from the peripheral endocrine gland. And of course that for real hormone can go back and shut off the hypothalamus and anterior pituitary in our classic negative feedback pathway. All right. This is where I can skip some things, I think. We talked about the pituitary gland. We have the anterior lobe and the posterior lobe. Um, we're only gonna talk about TSH in relation to the thyroid hormones, since that's a tropic hormone. We're only gonna talk about ACTH in relation to cortisol, because that's a tropic hormone. We've already talked about FSH and LH in the reproductive chapter. And we've also talked about PRL in the reproductive chapter. So that leaves one hormone left to talk about, growth hormone. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about that and what it does. Um, then of course the posterior lobe, um, we'll talk about that when we get there. And we, what's it, what, Never mind. we'll do that when we get there. All right, structurally, in the hypothalamus we know that's neural tissue and the neural tissue goes into uh, a set of blood vessels called the hypophyseal portal veins and secretes its hormones into these vessels. And these vessels have a direct link to the anterior pituitary where the hormones from the hypothalamus will flood the anterior pituitary, bind to the receptors on its target cells and cause the release of the secondary tropic hormone. Okay, so that's how this works. All right, in the previous slide you saw uh, stained. The anterior pituitary, like if you look at it under a microscope, it stains dark because it's crammed with cells, uh, endocrine cells, whereas the posterior pituitary does not stain as dark because mostly it's axons and not cellular. All right. Um, this is kind of a summary of the HPA axis. Uh, what I want you to know from here, we talked about these already. Your thyrotropin releasing hormone causes the release of causes the release of thyroid stimulating hormone, also known as thyrotropin. Okay, um, which goes down to the thyroid. All right, so that's a pathway we've talked about. That's a pathway we've talked about. We've talked about. Gonadotropin releasing hormone causes release, causes release of gonadotropins. We've talked about that. Um, notice what's in those, what's not in those compared to the ones over here. These hormones from the anterior pituitary have inhibitory hormones from the hypothalamus and stimulatory hormones. Okay, 
whereas these other ones don't. All right, so like prolactin releasing factor causes release of prolactin, but prolactin inhibiting factor inhibits the re release of prolactin. And so the only two that work that way are prolactin and growth hormone. And since the only one we're gonna talk about really is growth hormone, this is where you should focus your attention. Growth hormone releasing hormone from the hypothalamus causes a release of growth hormone from the anterior pituitary, and then that goes and has its effects. But another hormone, somatostatin, can inhibit the release of growth hormone, stopping the effects of it. All right, so here's my question to you, so, a critical thinking area. Why, what does it mean about these two hormones, growth hormone and prolactin, how they work compared to the rest of these hormones? Pardon? What about it? You get too much of it, it turns off. Which ones? No, just the opposite. Because these have inhibiting hormones, they're not gonna work like your classical negative feedback pathways, okay? That's why they have inhibiting hormones, because they don't operate under negative feedback, whereas the rest of these do. All right, uh, all I wanted you to get from this slide is that you have a bunch of different types of cells in the anterior pituitary, and those specific cells secrete those specific hormones, and they're named according to the hormones they secrete. That's all this slide is telling you. And a lot of this stuff that we're talking about, I won't directly test you on, but it may be part of a question, and in order to understand what that question is asking, you have to understand that concept. And that's what I find a lot, especially with undergrads, that they don't get is that, what do I need to know for the exam? Well, you need to know all of this because I can't directly test you on it, but it's gonna be part of understanding that process. So what, I had one student years ago, then she ended up being a nurse on my unit and I had to work under her, which was the oddest thing. She's a good student though, um, who called all of that fluff. Like, can we just take out all the fluff? Like, if I take out all the fluff, then that limits understanding. Okay, let's talk about growth hormone and your growth as in knowledge, right? All right. I know, shut up. Get on with it. Because I know, I know Gabe's seen it. Um, uh, Mighty Python and a Holy Grail. Get on with it! Um, Okay, growth hormone. Uh, for every, I, for every, maybe most hormones, I have this kind of layout. Where is it produced? Okay, anterior pituitary. Where does it act? In other words, what's its target? Liver, bones, and other peripheral tissues. What is its structure? Or what is, is it steroid or non-steroid? So if it's a protein hormone, we would classify it as? Non-steroid. Um, that would make it water soluble. Okay, growth hormone causes growth because it increases protein synthesis for one. Okay, and anytime, what is that word we use when we increase protein synthesis to build things? Anabolism, right? So it's an anabolic hormone. Right. In order to increase protein synthesis, you have to get amino acid into cells. Okay. So what are you going to start putting on your cell surface? Amino acid transporters. You have to increase your rate of transcription because you have to bind to DNA, make specific proteins. You have to increase your rate of translation and you have to decrease protein metabolism because if you are building things up inside your cells, then tearing things down would do just the opposite, okay? It would inhibit the effects you're trying to, to, uh, to have. So that's a general overview of 
what growth hormone does. Okay. Um, so what this slide is showing you is that it also in in increases fatty acid catabolism and inhibits glucose catabolism. In other words, growth hormone will cause your body to use preferentially fats for energy as opposed to glucose for energy. Does anybody know why that might be? More dense. More Pardon? Energy, more energy dense. More energy per molecule in fats than you do have in, uh, in, in glucose. So you're going to start using uh, fats for energy. Therefore, you're going to go to fat. You're going to break down fat. And you're going to release triglycerides and free fatty acids into the circulation so cells can take them up and say, hey, we have all this energy. All right. Then you're going to inhibit the effects of insulin on adipose tissue so that glucose isn't going in there to make more fat. Okay. So specifically in fat tissue and to some degree other areas, growth hormone inhibits the effects of insulin. Okay, thus, as this slide shows, inhibiting the utilization of carbohydrates. All right, so increased protein production, increased use of fats for energy, decreased use of glucose for energy. All right, lots of stuff on this slide, but only the yellow are things that you should be responsible for because we covered the other stuff in the previous slides. Factors that affect growth hormone. Increased exercise. Okay, if you're increasing exercise, you're putting stress on your body. The way your body responds to that is to, hey, we got to grow more stuff to be able to make our body handle that stress. So let's start growth hormone release. Testosterone and estrogen also affect growth hormone, increase growth hormone. Deep sleep. This is why it's so important for you to have a regular sleep schedule and regular sleep cycles because deep sleep promotes bone, uh, not bone, well, bone growth, but growth hormone. All right. So that is a proposed mechanism why some children may be shorter than others is because they didn't have good sleep patterns when they were kids. And of course, GH, RH from the hypothalamus can also increase growth hormone release. What inhibits growth hormone? Aging. All right. I have less growth hormone in my body than you have in your body. You have less growth hormone in your body than my son has in his body. And he has less growth hormone in his body than my two-year-old niece has in her body. Actually, she's one-year-old. One-year-old niece has in her body. Okay, so there's a dose dosing effect. The younger you are, the more, more, generally speaking, the more growth hormone you're going to have. All right. That inhibitory hormone from the hypothalamus, somatotropin or somatostatin, growth hormone inhibiting hormone, that's what GHIH stands for, can inhibit growth hormone. And increasing growth hormone can inhibit growth hormone. So what does that tell you? It does operate by negative feedback to some degree. To some degree. Pardon? Yes. Yep. And actually, um, some of that, whether somatostatin is slowing it down or whether uh, increased levels of growth hormone slow it down, will also depend on your age as well. So they may, uh, one may predominate over the other across certain age spans. All right. You want to take a break? All right, sweet. We're going to take a second break, yeah. Uh, if you guys don't need it, I'll need it. Let's see. 
All right, posterior pituitary. Two hormones secreted by there. We went over one of them. What is it? No. <laughs> Antidiuretic. All right. Now, just to remind you that the neurons that are um, associated with the posterior pituitary start in the hypothalamus and they end in the posterior pituitary. So the hormones that are secreted by the posterior pituitary made in the hypothalamus get transported down the axon to the posterior pituitary and then they get released as a neurohormone. All right, that's why we call them neurosecretory cells. All right, the first one is antidiuretic hormone, known as vasopressin. We've already talked a lot about that one, okay? In essence, what does it do? It causes you to retain water. If you have a problem with antidiuretic hormone, what's the, disor what's the disorder? If you have too little antidiuretic hormone? Diabetes, Diabetes insipidus. Okay, if the problem is in your brain, it's neurogenic, right? No ADH making or no ADH release. If the problem's in your kidneys where the receptors are located, then it's nephrogenic, nephrogenic. good. Okay. Uh, okay, so we'll focus on oxytocin for our purposes. Does that mean that you're not gonna be tested on antidiuretic hormone? No, it just means we covered it already and I'm not gonna waste your time going over it again unless you really need me to. So oxytocin is the other hormone. Um, where does it act? In the uterus, the smooth muscle layer, myometrium, and in the smooth muscle surrounding mammary glands, okay? So what's it gonna contract? The uterus? What's it gonna contract? Milk ducts. It's a peptide hormone, which means it's water soluble. And of course we know it uh, is associated with muscle contractions. So again, we talked about the positive feedback mechanism of oxytocin with the uterine muscle. You stretch the uterine wall, it sends a signal up to the hypothalamus. It says, hey, we got some stretching going on here. We wanna push, oxytocin's released, contracts that smooth muscle and you push the baby down farther. Right. With milk glands, put the baby to your breast, baby starts suckling. As it's suckling, oxytocin is released, which causes uh, smooth muscle around the breast ducts to squeeze, and that squeezes milk out into the uh, baby's mouth. This can be also a conditioned response. I don't know if you've heard of this before, that when the baby starts crying, mom will automatically start secreting milk because it's an anticipation of that response. All right, oxytocin more recently, and by more recently I mean within the past probably 15 years, has been associated with, it's the, cuddle, the cuddling hormone, okay? Because what they've noticed, research has found, is that um, with newborns and their mom, or with people who are in love, or people who have just had sexual intercourse and are cuddling, oxytocin spikes, okay? So they think oxytocin is associated with those warm, connected feelings with each other, okay? I am grossly defective in oxytocin. <laughs> I'm Do what? I'm oh, she knows I'm grossly de defective. <laughs> defective with oxytocin she's like if she, if if she were getting this lecture she'd be like i'm we're going to the doctor all right um if you have lack of oxytocin um you can potentially have feeding problems with your infant okay because you're not squirting that milk out uh you could potentially have birthing problems all right if you don't have oxytocin telling your uh uterus to squeeze you're not gonna be able to give birth how do we get around that women Okay, C-section. Inducing. And inducing, which is giving what? Pitocin. Pitocin, which is a synthetic oxytocin. Okay. 
if you have too much oxytocin and you have like super strong sustained contractions, you can actually have a ruptured uterus, okay, which could be a problem as well. So um, one thing you guys always have to remember when you're talking about hormones and especially their disorders, there are effects when you have too much and there are effects when you have too little. And that's why everybody hates endocrine because like, oh my God, we got to go both ways. Yes, you do. All right, thyroid gland. We talked a lot about this one. Okay, so I'm not going to go through all the details of this. We know where it's located. We know that thyroid hormone is made and secreted from these follicles, which have the follicular cells and the colloid. And what's the integral part of thyroid hormones? What has to be present in your body in order for them to be made and work properly? Iodine which is one of the reasons why we have iodized salt. For those of you, never mind. Um, okay, we know what thyroid hormones are important. What, what are your two thyroid hormones? T3 and T4. Which one is the most abundant? T4, but which one is the most active? T3. So if you have more T4, how does that work when T3 is the more active? You guys remember? T4 gets converted into T3. Good. In the target cells, T4 gets converted into T3. Okay, and then it has its, uh, has its effect. Good. There's also, um, and this is really interesting if you want to read some more about it, reverse T3 is also made. So you have, uh, this would be your T3, reverse T3, would mean the iodine is over here. Now the interesting thing about that is reverse T3 can bind to the T3 receptor but has zero effect. So you could have, when you test, normal amounts of thyroid hormone but hypothyroid symptoms if you have too much reverse T3 present. If you have too much reverse T3 you could have normal thyroid hormones, like when I test your thyroid, you have no, normal thyroid hormones, but symptoms of hypothyroidism because you have reverse T3 binding, but it's not doing anything. So it's going to act like hypothyroid. So then would you just talk about this more, more, more easily? Yeah. Or would your body just like convert it to the normal form? Is that a thing? Like it only convert, what if it only converts it to the reverse T3? Is that a condition? Then, uh, I don't know the answer to that, but you can take you can take synthetic T3, right, to fix that. So it's um, during the cleaving is when the reverse T3 is made. So it's put different or the other side, iodine is the one that's put into the, or is it the iodine when it's put on? Oh, okay. When it's put on, so all that that's happening in the colloid. <clears throat> All right, we know it's fat soluble, it produces hormones, and it produces proteins, um, and it operates on a negative feedback pathway. Okay, is there anything more that we need to go over about that? Okay, I will remind you about this. If you have too little thyroid hormone, that's hypothyroidism. If you have too much thyroid hormone, that's to hyper thyroidism okay without looking look at me what would your hyperthyroid patient look like sweaty, sweaty. Yeah. skinny tachycardic, tachycardic. high energy, high energy. <laughs> okay what would your hypothyroid look like cold, cold. cold. oh for heat intolerant for the other one too cold bradycardia Lethargic. Okay, good. So you have a good idea what these do for the body. So in essence, T3 and T4 do what to our body cells? Increase metabolism. So if you have it, if you have increased metabolism, you're going to be ramped up. If you have decreased metabolism, you're not going to be so ramped up. All right. Parathyroid. 
we already covered this too. Parathyroid glands are on the opposite side of the thyroid gland, so there are four little spots in the back. Um, we'll do this this way. Parathyroid hormone has its effects on what mineral electrolyte? Calcium. Okay. All right. What does PTH do to blood calcium? Pardon? I, I didn't hear what you said. It increases calcium. Okay, it increases calcium. All right. Therefore, what is the trigger for PTH release? Low calcium triggers PTH release to increase blood calcium. Okay. Now, increased blood calcium will trigger the release of calcitonin. And what does calcitonin do? Decreases blood calcium. And then you can cycle that back up. Okay? So that's how these hormones work. People mix these up all the time. Okay? Calcitonin. Think calcium in. Calcitonin in. Okay? Keeps your calcium in. Your bone. If you're keeping your calcium in your bone, what's happening to it in the blood? It's decreasing, okay? Parathyroid hormone makes no sense in terms of calcium, right? All right. Quick discussion of how it works, okay? Water-soluble peptide hormone increases PTH, increases blood calcium. It does it in three ways. One, it'll go to the kidneys and cause the kidneys to make, or activate rather, vitamin D. Vitamin D will then go to the small intestine and cause the small intestine to do what? Increase calcium absorption. Any guess on how it does that? What did we say about vitamin D3, vitamin D earlier? It can act as a hormone, all right? This is going to seem like a stretch here, but stay with me. What did aldosterone do to have its effects? Do you remember? Aldosterone causes sodium reabsorption. How does it do that? What about pumps? What about them? It put more pumps there. Good. It causes the making of more sodium potassium pumps. We'll learn later that it does some other things too. So what vitamin D does in the small intestine is it puts more calcium pumps on the lumen. So you actually absorb more calcium that way. All right. So those are two areas. The third area is in, I'm going to break a cardinal rule here and draw a bone that doesn't exist. Just see a nice drawing. Don't patronize me. Uh, I don't know why I drew the arrow. In the bone. <laughs> so parathyroid hormone increases blood calcium. How does it do that with the bone? It breaks bone down. So in order to break down bone down, you have to increase the activity of osteoclasts. All right? Now, one thing I didn't tell you before, so this all goes, this is all increasing blood calcium. In your kidney, not only will you make vitamin D3, but you'll also... Uh, actively reabsorb calcium that you got rid of in the tubule, right? While you're doing that, your kidneys are also getting rid of phosphate because when you break down bone, you're releasing calcium and phosphate into the blood. You want to keep the calcium, 
but you have to get rid of that phosphate. Does anybody know why? So that's what that graph is showing, is getting rid of the phosphate. Anybody know why? No? Good guess, though. I can, I can see why you said that. Does it have something to do with phosphorylation? No. Calcium phosphate will precipitate. And what if you have all this precipitate in your blood? What's going to happen? Right. It's going to clog things. So you want to get rid of that phosphate. All right. That's just showing uh, a summary of everything we just talked about. I think you guys, it's, that was in your lecture for the pre-pharmacology. Um, so good summary slide. And then calcitonin. All right. Calcitonin, we already went through the uh, kind of how it's related to parathyroid hormones. So calcitonin doesn't raise blood calcium. It decreases blood calcium. All right. The way it does this, is in the bone. Okay, so if you want to decrease blood calcium and you're using the bone to do that, what does calcitonin activate? Osteoblast, osteoblast build, build bone, okay? And it will inhibit osteoclasts, right? That's what it does. What am I missing? No. I'm missing kidneys. I'm missing small intestine. So parathyroid hormone, even though it works on bones, kidneys, small intestine, calcitonin, bone. Okay. All right, we good with that? Let's see. Next time I'll have uh, Madison come up here and draw a bone for me. You're not going to live that down. So this is a good summary slide um, showing you blood calcium drops, what parathyroid hormone does, blood calcium increases, what calcitonin does. All right. If you have too much parathyroid hormone, you're going to have too much what else? Calcium. So that will give you pathologic hypercalcemia, okay? So the effects of that, decreases in bone density, you're at risk for fractures and deformities. Also, since calcium is an extracellular cation, that's going to increase the amount of positive ions outside of the cell, making it harder to send, uh, to depolarize a neuron. So... Neurological responses are going to be reduced. Hypoparathyroidism lead to pathologic hypocalcemia. And as far as the nervous system goes, just the opposite. Okay? Just the opposite. What about building more bone? Could that be a problem? Not generally speaking. You could argue that if you have that, your bones are going to get too thick and you're going to get too heavy. But I think the trade-off of that is not pathologic. It's not going to be so much that you're going to notice any significant difference. I don't know that for sure. But if it were the case, it would have made it to a textbook. Right? Does anybody know what the lag time for information into a textbook is? About 20, 30 years. Whoa. Yes. So that whole spiel I gave you guys about um, microglia in the brain and that kind of stuff, you won't start seeing that in textbooks and therapeutics until probably about 10, 15 years from now. Probably. Mm -hmm. I hope it happens sooner, but... This is why progress is slow. And then we have a bunch of people 
I'm not going to, I'm going to refrain from talking about them negatively that are anti-science. And anyway, I don't understand. I don't understand America. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> I want to take another break now. Adrenal glands. All right, moving on to the adrenal glands. We've already talked about that. First of all, where are they located? The top of the kidneys. All right. And they have two parts to them. We have the adrenal cortex and the adrenal medulla. Adrenal cortex secretes nothing but steroids. Adrenal medulla is um, amino acid-based hormones. Okay, specifically our catecholamines. Again, we showed the picture earlier, they are derived from tyrosine. So you make both epinephrine and norepinephrine. All right? And even though they go into the blood, and once they're in the blood, they make it to all cells of the body, their effects are very similar to what you would see with the uh, sympathetic nervous system. So if the sympathetic nervous system, when activated, causes what in general? Fight or flight? Hormones from the adrenal medulla would do the same thing. They would, uh, what do we want to call that? Exacerbate the effects of the central nervous, or the sympathetic nervous system. All right, when we talk about the sympathetic nervous system, what is the primary uh, neurotransmitter involved at the at the postganglionic neuron, not ACH. Postganglionic. Norepinephrine. Okay, norepinephrine or noradrenaline. With the hormones, epinephrine or adrenaline predominate. Okay, so if we're if you want to keep them separate, norepinephrine for the sympathetic nervous system, epinephrine for the um, adrenal medulla. Okay, although there's a little bit of norepinephrine in there as well. All right, so what it does is it prolongs our sympathetic nervous system activity by a little bit. Okay, and the purpose, of course, is to help the body deal with stress. Oh. Why is norepinephrine and epinephrine released? Because the cells within the adrenal medulla are modified sympathetic neurons, okay? Which means they're gonna work in a very similar way. All right, the adrenal cortex, remember we have three regions. The outermost region releases aldosterone. And where are the effects of aldosterone? Where are the effects of aldosterone? Kidneys. Okay, specifically the PCT and the collecting duct. No, not PCT, DCT. All right, the middle layer, zona fasciculata, primarily cortisol, and that's the one we talked about with pharmacology. And then the zona reticularis is our mostly androgens, and we're not going to go into the effects of that. All right, <clears throat> so I'll put it to you this way. When we did the kidneys, we talked about aldosterone already, okay? And when we talk about aldosterone, it's linked to the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, all right? The trigger for that system is low sodium, sodium. so that's means that aldosterone being released is going to increase sodium. And generally speaking, when we increase sodium, we also increase water reabsorption, but only if what's present? ADH. Good. Okay, but what I may not have uh, focused on is that aldosterone secretion can be s directly and more strongly stimulated by uh, increases in potassium levels. All right, so if, it does, if that happens, too much potassium 
directly secretes aldosterone, doesn't have to go through the RAS pathway, and causes you to get rid of potassium immediately. Why is that so important? Why is an increase in potassium so bad that you have to get rid of it directly? Right, it can cause really problematic arrhythmias. Okay. In fact, lethal injection, potassium chloride. All right, so aldosterone is what's known as a mineralocorticoid, mineral being sodium, so it acts by affecting the sodium, okay, sodium reabsorption in this yellow location here, which is the DCT and collecting duct. All right, we've already talked about how it works. When aldosterone binds to the renal tubular cells, I have red over here for, we're going to just say it's the blood, but really it's interstitial fluid, then goes into the blood. Here is yellow for urine, okay, in the tubule. Aldosterone binds, goes to the nucleus, causes the production of what we talked about, the sodium-potassium pump, but it also causes the production of sodium channels and potassium channels on the tubular side of that cell. All right, so the way this works is sodium this sodium potassium pump will continuously pump sodium out of the cell. So what's going to be the concentration of sodium inside the cell? Low. If we have a sodium channel on the opposite side and a lot of sodium here but very little inside the cell, what's that channel going to allow sodium to do? Go in. And then it's, um, that pump's going to pump it right back out. Now if we have this pump also pumping potassium in, the concentration of potassium inside the cell is going to be relatively high, so if we put a channel for potassium there, potassium is going to be constantly leaking out into the lumen, and that's how you get rid of potassium and reabsorb sodium, with putting new pumps and new channels on specific locations of these renal tubular cells. Okay, is this an immediate effect? No. Steroid hormones, remember, take a long time. You've got to produce these proteins. Okay, we've already talked about this. What happens if we have too much aldosterone? Okay, this, we didn't talk about this at all. Hyperaldosterone is ism, usually from an aldosterone secreting tumor. Okay, could be on your um, adrenal glands, but you can also have aldosterone secreting tumors elsewhere in your body as well, which is part of the problem because you don't see a problem with your adrenal glands, but you have too much aldosterone that would lead you to suspect that you have a tumor growing somewhere else. Okay, so too much aldosterone, you're going to have too much sodium retention. If you have too much sodium retention, generally speaking, you're going to have too much volume. So what are you going to look like? Swollen. You're going to be, <laughs> you're going to be swole. Not really. Not like that. Um, and high blood pressure. Okay, too much volume. You're also going to have too little potassium. All right, so potassium is one of those really funny things. The uh, range of potassium is extracellularly is 3.5 to 5. That's a very small range to keep something within. All right, too little potassium, arrhythmias. Too much potassium, arrhythmias. Okay, both are bad. Hypoaldosteronism, just the opposite. Loss of sodium, decreased volume, decreased blood pressure, too much potassium, again, risk for arrhythmias. Actually, we say arrhythmias, dysrhythmias. Arrhythmia would be no rhythm. Dysrhythmia would be a messed up rhythm. All right, and then we talked about cortisol. Okay, we talked about that directly in the, uh, the pharmacology lecture. We know where it's secreted, we know it's a stress hormone, and it, what it does really is it prolongs the effects of the hormones from the adrenal medulla. So if those epinephrine and norepinephrine go to uh, mediate a stress response, cortisol will further that stress response. Okay, but what do we know about cortisol? 
and stress and if it goes on too long. Why is it bad? Okay, could lead to diabetes. I'm thinking that's that is true. What else could it do? Immune system suppression. So this is why when you guys are prescribing corticosteroids for your patients, you also have to be concerned about their immune health as well. All right, steroid hormone locations inside of the receptors inside the cell. We already went through this. Uh, what cortisol does, it increases blood glucose to help you deal with that stress. Okay, also free fatty acids, so provides energy. And as um, Gabe suggested, if it goes on long enough and glucose is too high for too long, could lead to diabetic-like uh, effects, All right? Also, we know it, too much cortisol inhibits the inflammatory cascade at different areas, so causes cells to stop releasing inflammatory mediators, stops capillaries from responding and becoming leaky, and it stops leukocytes from getting out of the capillaries into the site of inflammation. All right, so more prone to infection, and it suppresses T cells. What kind of T cells? All T cells. Okay, uh, I don't know if I went over this in any detail, but what do we mean by stress, trauma, any kind of trauma? Like let's say you're a child and you're constantly going home to a dad who's yelling at you all the time or makes, is threatening all the time. That's a traumatic event that will lead to stress. Infection is a stressor, okay, to your body, heat and cold. I just heard on, uh, I listened to this podcast called the, the, the Seven. Anybody ever heard of this before? It's a newer one. It's from the Washington Post, and they give the seven biggest news stories of the day. And it gets put out about 7.30 every morning, um, Apple Podcasts. The one this morning was out west. They are, and actually in the Middle East, are experiencing the hottest temperatures that have been recorded in recent history. And one uh, statement they made kind of really hit me this morning is, I forget exactly where this was, but the temperature is so high, it's approaching the upper limit of human survivability, which sucks. So that means if you go out and you try to operate in this heat, you're not going to do very well, All right? Sympathetic activation. Surgery is a stressor, in fact, or surgery infection. That's what that says, surgery infection as opposed to regular infection. Restraints. Uh, I talked to several of you in my office the other day about uh, using restraints in psych settings. That's a stressor to a person. And diseases can be a stressor as well. So all of those we consider stress and can initiate the stress response. All right, cortisol acts on the negative feedback, and uh, it's supposed to, okay? So when you have enough cortisol, it's supposed to go back, shut off ACTH, it's supposed to shut off corticotropin releasing hormone, and then shut off all the effects of cortisol on target organs. One of the problems is that if you have stress going on for too long, it actually leads to the down regulation of receptors for cortisol especially in a hypothalamus and the pituitary. And if you have down regulation of receptors, you're not gonna shut off that response. Cortisol is gonna to continue to be secreted. Okay, so um, that leads to this response to stress, uh, general adaptation syndrome. What the general adaptation syndrome is, and I just watched a video on this yesterday, uh, this guy in the 1960s came up with this, which leads me to think we need a better response, a better model. But anyway, this is what happens. The alarm stage, normal. That's epinephrine and norepinephrine. We have a stressful event. Whoop. Sympathetic discharge. 
resistant stage is where cortisol comes in. So this is epi, norepi. This would be our cortisol stage. Okay. And the, this resistance stage, why it's called the resistance stage, is that our body uh, starts to become resistant to the shutting off of this mechanism. So we're over-responding for a lo too long of a period of time, uh, which then leads to the third stage, which is the exhaustion stage. You've exhausted all of your possible resources, and you start getting sick from this. And by sick, I mean diseases, infections, things like that, okay? So that's our general adaptation syndrome and how these hormones are involved in it. <clears throat> All right, you guys remember this, Cushing's? Cushing's is too much cortisol. Addison's, too little cortisol. Which one's more common? Cushing's. Cushing's. All right. And what's one of the reasons Cushing's is more common that has nothing to do with actual cortisol from your body? Prescribed corticosteroids. Could lead to that. All right, sex hormones. Um, not gonna cover. We've already talked a lot about those. So let's go to the pancreas. We might get done in two hours. That would be sweet. Uh, see what going over this early helps with? Like we were able to just skim. If you have questions, if you're not understanding this, like I said, raise your hand, let me know, or come talk to me uh, the rest of this week. I'd be happy to talk with you about it. Let's go over the pancreas. This is where we slow down. Stay awake. All right. Pa we're specifically the endocrine pancreas. We have little islands of cells within the exocrine pancreas called islets of Langerhans. Uh, please don't call them islets. I will make fun of you for that. <laughs> islets of, because they're little islands. You wouldn't say I'm going to the Hawaiian islands, <laughs> right? So islets of Langerhans. Oh, oh, oh. Let's get on another soapbox of mine. My in-laws, you know what they put on their salads? <laughs> Sweet. That'd be gross. Actually, our former clinical coordinator refused to put salad dressing on her salads. Like, yeah? Anyway, what they put on their salads is Italian dressing. I'm like, where'd you get that? Idly? <laughs> anyway, same concept here. Yes, they know I make fun of them. Uh, so we have different cell types in our islets. So these are just small little things inside the, inside the pancreas. But the two that you really need to know about are alpha cells, which secrete a hormone called glucagon, and beta cells, which secrete insulin. Now, Insulin, both, actually both of these, what do they work on? Blood glucose. Okay, insulin does what to blood glucose? Decreases blood glucose, therefore glucagon would increase blood glucose. Okay, so insulin shuts off, or insulin decreases blood glucose, glucagon increases blood glucose, therefore, this is where that up and down thing comes in. What's the stimulus to release insulin? Increase glucose. And what's the stimulus to decrease, secrete glucagon? Decrease. decrease glucose. Okay. Good. Um. One of the reasons why I really also want to slow down with this is that if you guys are going into primary care, one of the number one diseases you're going to be treating and seeing people for and reminding them over and over and over again is about their diabetes. Okay, huge problem. 
okay? Just a reminder of where the pancreas is. I don't think you guys can forget that. Um, what it looks like and what these little islands are. So before we were concerned with all of this. Now we're concerned about this little island, okay? Islets of Langerhans, what they do. So let's talk about insulin. <clears throat> all right, we know where it's produced. Where does it act? All your textbooks will tell you muscle, muscle, liver, and fat. But don't all the cells of your body require glucose? So really all cells of your body, okay? Osteoblasts, osteoclasts, fibroblasts, all of those. So essentially all tissues. Uh, it's a peptide and therefore water soluble. So its surface, its, cell, its receptor is on the surface of the cell. All right. The way it works, it's secreted as what's called, or not secreted, it's made as pro-insulin. You chop off part of it, and then you have the insulin peptide, which is then secreted, leaving behind C-peptide. All right, and it's degraded in a liver. So as far as pharmacology goes, what does that mean? No. That means metabolism of insulin, right, in the liver. Do I care for this class what enzyme it is? No. Do what? <laughs> He's spouting it out over here. All right, so if the goal of insulin is to decrease blood glucose, it's going to be secreted in response to increase blood glucose, All right? So. What is normal glucose levels in your body? Fasting. Say? Or 70 to 110. It depends on what hospital you're at. Okay. Um, I think in a couple slides I use 70 to 110, but in that rough range. Okay. So if you get a blood panel back from your patients and it says uh, they did blood glucose and it says 115 high. Are you going to be super concerned about that? No. If it says 459 high, well, yeah, then you should be concerned. All right. You saw you jumped right in front of me. <laughs> Cat. Um, <laughs> if, if insulin decreases blood glucose, where does the glucose go? Good, into the cells. Undergrad lectures, I would have to sit there for 20 minutes waiting for them to figure that out. Painful. Yes, into the cells. It goes into the cells. Because what do the cells need it for? Energy. ATP production. Okay, good. All right. But it's going to go into cells with insulin receptors, which are most of your cells. What cells of your body or what location specifically does not require insulin to take glucose in? Brain, okay? So it will have no receptors for it because it doesn't need it. Glucose regularly goes in. What other part of your body has insulin receptors but the use of them is conditional? Not heart. I'll give you a hint, it's on that list up there. Skeletal muscle. When skeletal muscle is working, in other words, during exercises, you don't need the receptor. You don't need insulin to get glucose into the cell. Okay? Working skeletal muscle also does not need insulin for glucose to get in. Okay? All right. So once glucose gets in the cell, by means of insulin, what does that cell do with the glucose? One, it uses it as energy, okay? But if glucose is high and you have a bunch coming in, you're not gonna be able to use all that glucose right away. So what are you gonna do with the excess? Glycogen, you're gonna store it, okay? 
if you've maxed out your glycogen because glycogen is water soluble and it gets really heavy and bulky inside the cell, what are you going to convert that glucose into? Adipose tissue or fats. Okay. And since you have all this glucose and you're using it for energy and you're storing it, you're not going to want to make new glucose. So gluconeogenesis is going to be shut down, as well as glycogenolysis, which is the breakdown of glycogen. Okay? Now, if your cells are in an energy surplus, high glucose, insulin's pouring it into your cells, what also might you want to do during that time period when energy's high? Make stuff. Okay, so insulin will also cause the influx of amino acids into the cell so that you can make proteins to do what a cell is supposed to do. Okay, so that would be the energy part. It's using energy to do that stuff. The rest it's saying, hey, we've got enough energy, let's store some too for future use. Okay, the end result of that is blood glucose decreases. Okay. Okay, this already talks about what I already talked about. What does insulin actually do? All right, this is a very big and confusing slide. I highlighted the things you should pay attention to. Okay, the big thing uh, insulin does is it binds to the insulin receptor and starts a cascade of events that take a pool of glucose transporters and puts them on the surface of the cell. So every cell in your body inside of it has vesicles that have all these glucose transporters on them. And when insulin binds to its receptor, they get the signal to go whoosh, get put on the cell membrane. Okay, and that's why a lot of glucose is being able to be taken into the cell because of the signal transduction pathway, putting more glute for receptor, receptors, uh, channels, carriers on the surface of the membrane. Make sense? Now, what does all this other stuff mean? Signaling pathways that trigger the other effects of insulin. Glycogen synthesis, lipolysis, fatty acid synthesis, protein synthesis. So all this is achieved by signal transduction pathways from one hormone binding to one receptor. Okay, many different pathways are activated. All right. This one, I would argue, for our purposes, is the most important. You're putting glucose carriers on the surface of the cell so glucose can come in. All right, this slide is just a summary of everything we've talked about, okay? When you have glucose, it's gonna go into the cell and you're gonna make fats store and store it. You're gonna make glycogen, you're gonna store it and you're going to make proteins because amino acids are going to be triggered to go into the cell as well. All right. <clears throat> uh, there it is. 70 to 110 is our base basal glucose, okay, where our body likes to keep it during fasting conditions. It's not until it gives above that 110 Okay, not until it gets above that 110 that you start secreting insulin to any appreciable amount. Okay, and then the higher the glucose concentration, the more insulin you're going to secrete up to a point. Okay, you've maxed out the system at some point. Okay, so this is just a graph showing you how the increase in glucose concentration is related to increases in insulin secretion. All right, now how the hell does the beta cell in the pancreas know when to secrete insulin? Okay, well, we know it's secreted when insulin level or glucose levels are high. So when glucose gets above a certain concentration, it starts pouring in through a GLUT2 receptor, GLUT2 channel, all right? How is that different than the other channels that were in other cells? It was GLUT4. GLUT4. 
Okay, so they're different channels. Okay, you have GLUT2 channels in the uh, beta cells of the pancreas, but GLUT4 in most of the cells of your body. All right, that will start a signaling pathway, okay, that will depolarize the cell, cause calcium to come in, because it, um, you know, that's usually what stimulates secretion of things. And then calcium will cause these vesicles to re uh, filled with insulin to release into the uh, bloodstream. What does this remind you of? How axon terminals work. You depolarize the axon terminal, calcium comes in, causes vesicles to release things. All right, so this from here to here is no different than an axon terminal. Right? You're pouring in calcium. This here, calcium would be your second messenger to get insulin to be secreted. Right, good. Now, when insulin's secreted, we're going to assume that the uh, beta cells have already made a bunch and are being stored in vesicles. All right, so when insulin binds or when glucose triggers, back up. When you have an increase in glucose and that triggers the release of insulin, you're going to release all those secretory vesicles. All right, so that is what's responsible for this immediate rise in insulin. All right, then insulin falls. Why does it start falling? Pardon? That's why insulin starts falling? Insulin starts falling because you've secreted as much insulin as you have. So what's happening is the beta cells are like, well, shit, we need to make some more. So right about here, they'll start making more. That takes a little bit of time, and that's why you see this second increase in insulin release. We call that a biphasic release, and this is something that's seen. This is, this is the how insulin is actually released, this biphasic secretion. You release all of the uh, vesicles, then you make more insulin, put it in the vesicles so that you can continue to release insulin. All right, that's what is responsible for that biphasic release. All right, makes sense? So that's insulin. So if we have a, um, let me see something real quick. Maybe. Do you want to take a break or you want to muscle through it? Just go through it. There's not a whole lot left. Um, okay, let's talk about diabetes real quick. If we have an autoimmune disease, you guys did this in farm, right? You have an autoimmune disease that destroys beta cells. You won't be able to respond to glucose, therefore not release insulin. Okay. So if we don't have the cells anymore to respond to glucose to release insulin, what's going to happen to blood glucose? It's going to constantly be high. All right, how do we fix that? We give insulin. Okay, we give insulin. Now, what type of diabetes is that? Type 1. Type 1, type one diabetes, insipidus or mellitus? Mellitus, mellitus good. Uh, type 1 diabetes, mellitus. So what's type 2? Good, insulin resistance. That means you're able to secrete enough insulin, beta cells are intact, but your cells aren't responding. All right, so that's the other thing that makes hormones difficult, is not only do you have this up and down thing, but you have, well, it could be a problem with releasing the hormone or it could be a problem responding to the hormone. Which is it, okay? What's one of the biggest mechanisms of why there's such a problem with type 2 diabetes in the U.S. today? Diet. Pardon? Diet. Diet and which? Diet and exercise, which leads to? Obesity. obesity. Why does obesity cause type 2 diabetes? Does anybody know? Because the receptors are overstimulated, so they don't react as much. Why? Because they're just always bombarded with sugar, so they're less reactive. Okay, that's one reason. Why else? Why does that matter? Not necessarily. That's not why it causes type 2 diabetes. You're correct. 
but that's not why it causes. Doesn't the increase of the nervous tissue essentially cause that resistance of the insulin to get formed? Why? How? Does anybody know that? No? You're like, all right, why don't you just tell us? Fine. On the very first slide of this um, lecture, I had a list of all of the endocrine glands, right? And then a small list of things at the bottom. What was the last thing on that small list? Adipose tissue. Adipose tissue, we're finding more and more every day that it is super metabolically active, all right? And one of the things that we're finding out that it releases are tons of endocrine factors, right? And what these endocrine factors do is they go to the cells of your body and either downregulate the receptors for insulin or they make the signaling pathways within the cell not work properly. Because remember, I showed you this complicated ass picture They could affect any one of these pathways that affect how insulin uh, causes the cell to respond, okay? So if you affect any of this pathway, what happens? You're not putting those GLUT4 vesicles on the surface. Therefore, you never get glucose coming into the cell. It's a little cheesy, but if you go out onto Canvas and look at the videos that I posted there, there are two videos made by some people in the UK that kind of go through cartoonishly how fat causes insulin resistance. So I recommend watching those. If nothing else, you'll be entertained. All right, moving on to glucagon. Glucagon increases blood glucose, okay? Now it increases blood glucose in the absence of glucose intake, okay? So that means it's not telling you to go eat stuff, okay? It's gonna do it with things you already have in your body. So it's produced by alpha cells in the pancreatic islets. It's also a peptide hormone, so it's water soluble. Essentially think of it as doing the exact opposite that insulin does. So if insulin takes glucose in, uses it for energy, what else does it do with it? Stores it, all right? Glucagon will say, hey, you've stored these glucose, why don't we break that down and put more glucose into the blood, all right? So that is the way in, that we will keep our glucose levels between 70 and 110 is glucagon will say, hey, we need more blood glucose to keep it up at a certain level. Let's secrete glucagon. Let's break down glycogen, which is called glycogenolysis. Let's turn amino acids and fat into glucose. That's called gluconeogenesis and raise that blood glucose levels. All right, where in our body are we breaking down glycogen to put into our, the blood? Liver. Mostly the liver. Can the muscles do that too? Yes. yes. Where are we converting non-glucose precursors into glucose? Fat, as well as liver, right? So the livers are big player in here, okay? Livers are a big player in how glucagon acts. All right, so the end result's gonna be an increase in blood glucose. And that's all we're gonna say about glucagon, all right, because the problem in society right now is not a problem with glucagon, it's a problem with insulin. All right, somatostatin, secreted by the delta cells, inhibits glucagon and insulin. All right, so when those get too high a level, somatostatin can shut them down, okay? Yes, this is the same somatostatin that you see in a hypothalamus, okay, but it has a different action here. We're not gonna go into the intricacies of that, okay? Uh, yes, I mean, 
<laughs> yes. Look. So it does act to inhibit glucagon and insulin directly within the, par uh, the, the uh, pancreatic islets. So that would be its paracrine function. But it will also do these other things as well that are associated with digestion. Okay, so remember, we had somatostatin in the hypothalamus. We also had somatostatin in certain cells in the, in the digestive tract as well. So all of those were geared towards um, digestion and increasing or decreasing blood glucose. Okay, so the purpose of somatostatin, and we're not getting into all the specifics of it, is it maximizes the use of the fuel that we have in our body. to do the things we need to do. All right, the glue, uh, the glue, the negative feedback of insulin and glucagon is essentially, somatostatin aside, glucose levels. So when glucose levels go up, you shut down, it's, or you have insulin production. When glucose levels go down, insulin production shuts off and glucose, glucagon production increases, all right? When glucose levels go back up then, insulin turns on, glucagon shuts off. Glucose levels go down, glucagon turns on, insulin shuts off. So it's a back and forth. And that's why throughout the day, even though it says 70 to 110, glucose levels will go like that, insulin levels, glucagon levels will also go like that. All right. We talked about diabetes mellitus, so I'm not going to go into that anymore because we just did a discussion of that. Watch those videos. I promise they will are entertaining. And then the last of this is other hormones by the body. We've already gone over a lot of those. Um, you guys told me in the heart we release ANP, and what you know what that does. And in GI tract, we have gastrin, secretin, cholecystokinin, somatostatin. Uh, other hormones in the GI tract that we didn't really go over that much. Um, they will uh, also help with stimulating the release of uh, insulin in the pancreas. Kidneys release renin, which is part of the RAS system. Kidneys will release calcitriol, which is also known as vitamin D, which aids in calcium reabsorption. Kidneys will also release erythropoietin, which will cause you to make new red blood cells, red blood cells which will increase your oxygen carrying capacity. Okay, turns out your skeleton also secretes hormones. Bones, bones secrete hormones, all right. Um, fibroblast growth factor 23, osteocalcin, okay? Osteocalcin sounds like it has to do with what? Calcium increases insulin production. Like what? Sometimes um, when somebody identifies a growth factor or a hormone coming from a certain area, or doing a certain thing, that's what they'll name it, okay? 10 years later, they'll find out this chemical does something else somewhere in the body, but it still retains this name. So that's why you have all these messed up names that have no relation to the function they actually do, okay? Just to give you a little bit of history. All right, hormone we haven't talked about, leptin. Okay, you've probably heard of leptin before. When leptin is released, that uh, promotes that satiety, that fullness feeling, like I don't want to eat anymore. Um, I'm going to argue that in some people, when they're stressed, leptin doesn't work, and that leads to stress eating. I'm saying this because I am a huge stress eater, and I ate a lot this summer. <laughs> Okay, um, adipose tissue, specifically adiponectin, that 
uh, will help reduce insulin re resistance, how that plays in with creating insulin resistance, uh, we're not going to get into. And then the liver secretes all kinds of hormones as well. So if the liver secretes all these hormones and the liver produces most of your plasma proteins, then your patient who comes in and uh, is an alcoholic and has all of these problems, what are the, is the first thing you're going to treat besides his alcoholism? Liver, right? You're going to want to make sure that liver gets healthy again. Um, speaking of alcoholics, <laughs> no, no, I'm not an alcoholic. <laughs> not yet, anyway. Um, does anybody know what the number one problem with alcoholics who are going through detox is? Seizures. Seizures. They are very, very prone to seizures. So one of the things that if you are doing detox things, and why am I telling you this? Because it came up and I do this every other weekend. Um, detox. No, I, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I check into a detox facility every other weekend and I, like that's like my vacation, that's my staycation. Um, no, because I deal with these patients, I'm monitoring, I'm asking them questions for uh, these detox symptoms, looking for seizures, looking for those things, because if we have somebody who's coming in for both alcohol and opiates, like, okay, I am, I'm drinking a case a day. Like, that's, people are drinking more than that sometimes. Um, and I'm snorting $1,000 worth of fentanyl every day. Okay. What are we going to treat first? The alcohol. Because the alcohol detoxing is going to be much more life-threatening than the opiates. Okay, that has nothing to do with this. I just thought as providers, you guys would find that interesting. Okay. Uh, growth factors are also considered in the hormone category, but a lot of them will uh, be paracrine. So epidermal growth factor, um, when do you think that would be released? Epidermal growth factor. Like injury, right, injury to your skin. What about nerve growth factor? <laughs> when you cut a nerve, right? And what about platelet-derived growth factor? When you have an injury and you have the clotting factors come in, platelets will release factors that will cause growth of tissue to fill in that space. And of course, we talked about angiogenic factors that will cause blood vessel formation uh, during certain conditions, okay? And I think that's your last slide, and I think that ends it in just over two hours. So I know that was a lot, and I know it was fast, and I know we covered half of it like before. So if you guys have any issues.